it's one month now the russian unprovoked and, and brutal aggression if i could be glad uh, it's that peace managed to organize this timely uh, debate together with uh, the ukrainian uh, partner ukrainian think tank uh, liaison office uh, in brussels in fact this is the third public debate uh, that we are organizing uh, on this wall and um, for the last three weeks and i'm convinced that ukrainian voice should be as much articulated uh, as possible. Here, I would like to thank Olena uh, Karbu, executive director and co-founder of the Ukrainian uh, think tank liaison office I mentioned, and our today's uh, panelists as well for the, her precious support to make this debate uh, a reality. Thank you so much, Olena. Um, I would also uh, welcome uh, our other uh, honorable panelists, Daniel Szeligowski, who at PISM uh, is uh, our head of Eastern Europe program and our key expert on uh, Ukraine. Then Stephen Blockmans, director of the Center for European Policy Studies, Femi Seps, uh, and uh, last but not least, uh, Boris uh, Yarokevich, who is a senior advisor uh, at the Eastern Europe and Central Asia Division at the European External Action Service. Good morning, all of you. And one more time, many thanks for accepting uh, our invitation. So I also kindly welcome uh, all gathered in person here uh, participants, uh, the same as our virtual uh, attendees. And following our speaker's introductory remarks, I count on your engagement, uh, questions and comments uh, in our Q&A session. I will come back to this point uh, with some technical uh, instructions uh, later. The context and, and the very focus of our today discussion is clear. To put it short, Russia, under Vladimir Putin's leadership uh, by attacking Ukraine, has just ruined our peace in Europe. And since the last, uh, our last week uh, discussion we had, Russia has been accelerating in committing war crimes uh, by massively bombing and killing uh, civilians, like the dramatic case of uh, Mariupol uh, witnesses. All this has provoked already dislocation of um, almost 10 million Ukrainians, including emigration of over than three and a half millions, including two millions to, to Poland. And the Western community, in particular EU, also via its member states, has provided Ukraine with comprehensive and fast support, especially in terms of weapon deliveries, uh, financial support and humanitarian assistance and step up in severe sanctions against uh, Russia. On top of that, yesterday, the EU foreign affairs ministers decided to raise the total of um, uh, 1 billion euro in frame of the European Peace Facility Fund to support Ukraine with arms supplies. But all these, and I think we can be clear on that, uh, all these means have not ceased Russian uh, aggression on this sovereign country. So should the EU do even more to support Ukraine? What Ukraine? urgently needs mostly to counter this invasion. What additional options like more sanctions are still on the table to further help Ukraine to resist the aggression? Yesterday, we also uh, heard Joseph Borrell saying that there is no time now to establish uh, sanctions on fossil fuels important, uh, imported from, uh, from Russia um, because it will be too much cost for, for the EU. Um, and most of all, what lessons we learned so far from our policy toward Russia in terms of plan for the next steps of sanctions, military support, financial support in face of uh, possible use of the chemical weapons uh, by Russia. These are central questions of our today's discussion. So I, I suggest without any further delay, let's, uh, let's move to our dear panelists. And we are really looking forward to hearing um, in more detailed more detailed perspectives on this war from Ukrainian, Polish, and from the more, more broader EU level uh, perspective, from an analyst and from a, a practitioner, EU diplomat. So, Olena, let's kick off with you, uh, with your welcome uh, words, and then let's move to the very essence of our team. We had already lucky to have you with us last, uh, last time, and we Two weeks ago, and we discussed uh, when we discussed this aggression. What is your assessment of the current um, um, situation in Ukraine? What are present internal developments of this war? How do you assess the EU support and the West support to, to Ukraine? What could be, in your opinion, 
be done more. Please, the floor is yours, Olena. Thank you, Lukas. Thank you for such welcoming uh, words. And on behalf of the Ukrainian think tank liaison office in uh, Brussels, I would like to welcome all speakers and all participants to this event. And I also would like to express our joy to continue cooperation with our Polish uh, colleagues from Polish Institute of International Affairs. Yes, I was asked to provide a general assessment uh, of the situation in Ukraine. I will picturize this uh, with a few, but to my mind, defining definitions, if you want. Ukraine is fighting. Our spirit is high. This is our existential war. And the majority of our people do understand this. We are deeply shocked by the abyss of the moral fall of the Russian population. We are extremely thankful for the standing with Ukraine by the countries and the citizens of the free world. And we need and we hope for more of practical help of Europe and the free world to stop and to win this war. And now I would like to uh, move to the issues which I do believe are of crucial importance and uh, answering the main question of this conference is how to support Ukraine in resisting the Russian invasion. And I would put uh, how to help Ukraine to win this war because this is of uh, absolute importance. Uh, I will start with remaining uh, about what kind of war we are dealing with and what kind of targets uh, Putin may pursue by uh, invading uh, Ukraine. And uh, first, uh, it would be the direct attack on Ukraine and with the purpose of restoration of the USSR or any kind of uh, uh, formulation he has in his head. And in this sense, uh, it includes elimination of Ukrainians as a nation, which actually doesn't exist according to him. And in this sense, Ukraine is a direct target. But the second target uh, of Putin and dimension of this war is actually destruction of the free world because it can, the Russian regime cannot coexist with the free world. And for, for Putin, it's important as much as uh, this uh, as destruction of Ukraine is attack on the free world to show that the system is not working, is not capable to defend its values, to defend its citizens. And in this war, and in this sense, the free world is also the target. And this second point indicates that not only Ukraine is in danger, but the free world as such. And this Russian one, one uh, yes, uh, once again, the Russian uh, war against Ukraine must be seen in this broader paradigm. And no one should really feel safe. Unfortunately, this understanding is still lacking in Europe. The war became an earthquake for the European continent, but the real understanding of danger, I'm afraid, is still to come. And the fact uh, that, the Russian, uh, that the Russian army appeared to be so weak should not also relax us, because unfortunately this weakness is largely compensated with their readiness and willingness uh, to uh, make, uh, to do outrageous acts, violence acts and committing crimes of war. Now, what uh, should be done. And many of the things, more, more, all of these things are already doing. What I would emphasize is on the increase in the level of uh, what has uh, been done and should be continued to be done. First and foremost, we need to help Ukraine to win this war. And the weaponization of Ukraine should be increased and be fastened. Why it is so important? Because only military defeat of Russia in Ukraine, combined with the fact of sanctions, can this uh, can provide the triggers to either regime falls from above or triggers the population to do something with this, because it will create both moral and socioeconomic triggers. And uh, Ukraine in this sense must become as a castle for this war or for any, any possible circle of this work in future. And here I will repeat just demands of the Ukrainian side. 
heavy weapons, air defense system, aircrafts, and this no-fly zone over Ukraine, or means to uh, means to be provided to Ukraine to do uh, to to achieve this goal by the Ukrainians themselves. And again, here again, I would like to thank for this uh, for the assistance which has been provided so far. Without this, we knew we know that we wouldn't be able to resist so fast, and so we wouldn't be able to go so far with resisting uh, Russia and these measures must be uh, prolonged. Now, uh, full economic sanctions. Yes, full economic sanctions must be increased and, um, uh, and we must achieve cancellation of all avenues for Russia to receive income from abroad. Because today's Russian economy, and I don't need to convince anyone here, is the basis for their military machine. And we need to switch it off before it takes more lives. And these sanctions and economic isolation must be off immediately as soon as possible, because the faster we uh, go on this path, the more lives we will be able to save. And here, what is important to also to highlight that the sanctions and isolation and economic isolation of Russia must not be lifted until the final defeat of Russia and her removal from all occupied territories, wherever they are. And to my mind, only achievements of these two goals, military defeat and economic uh, isolation, can bring the effect which we would like uh, to stop the war which has been started by Russia and to prevent it from expanding or from repetition. Uh, the most, uh, the third absolutely important element is the protection of Ukrainian civilians inside of Ukraine. The more pressure has to be put on Russia for this. And this is very good that we already started the recording of the crimes of war. And it became very clear that the Russian commander and uh, those who were participating in this invasion and other wars must be brought to court. And international humanitarian organizations should restore their full work inside of the country to help civilians and not to be taken as hostages in the Russian military operations. So this, I would say, these are three crucial issues for the immediate or for now. Now, when we speak about the future and uh, we already speak about what uh, kind of peace agreement could be and um, Provided, provided that Ukraine wins this war. And to my mind, this peace agreement should be about full restoration of Ukrainian territory and sovereignty, including the lands which have been occupied uh, in 2014, acceptance, acceptance by, of military defeat by Russia, reparations and security guarantees to Ukraine from existing and from real uh, collective security security structures uh, like NATO. Only this, and by the way, what is also important, that Ukraine should not agree or shouldn't be pushed to agree to anything less than this. Because agreeing less than this, it would mean only one thing, that we would give Putin and Russia time and uh, to reallocate resources, to mobilize resources and to attack again including not only on Ukraine. And we must be clear about this. And now speaking about the future and probably my colleagues will speak more about this. Yes, uh, the EU membership prospect for Ukraine, and I can confirm from the Ukrainian side that it has enormous moral um, uh, moral meaning for Ukrainians because it, this, it, this indeed provides the light in the end of the tunnel. And it gives hopes for all the suffering that it will may end and the country will have its future. And we do hope for fast and hopefully simplified track of uh, uh, obtaining membership uh, in the European Union, but at the same time, keeping a very close eye on the processes inside of Ukraine, including adherence to uh, its adherence to democratic uh, processes. And uh, as has been already mentioned by many, creation kind of uh, Marshall Plan for Ukraine where a large part of the funds must come from uh, frozen assets of Russia or from reparations of Russia. And so this would provide us 
the prospects to win this war, to uh, restore our country, to rebuild all institutions and to um, shine as this country deserve, deserves. Glory to Ukraine, glory to hero. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Olena. Uh, most of all for uh, putting attention on the fact that, uh, on the character of, of, of this war, that uh, I think uh, we should all the time repeat that uh, this war not just start, not, not, not has just started uh, one month ago, but uh, years ago, eight years ago. And if you mentioned uh, ceasefire agreements and negotiations, I have this impression that we've been talking about that for, for years and not just uh, as a recent uh, development. Uh, thank you, thank you uh, so much for, for your uh, intervention. Uh, let's move now to, to the Polish uh, perspective. Daniel, um, how you assess this uh, unprecedented military, financial and humanitarian use and its individual member states support for, uh, for Ukraine? And another key question that I think uh, our public is uh, interested to hear is about uh, Poland. Uh, uh, what does Poland stand for in this war? What is its particular role in supporting uh, Ukraine military in a humanitarian way as an EU member state, NATO ally? Moreover, Poland has taken over its uh, also chairmanship of the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe for 2022. And Poland, as I said in the beginning, uh, has received since the beginning of the invasion more than 2 million already refugees from Ukraine. And this is something uh, also unprecedented for, for, for our country. And if you take in, into account that there is no refugee camps, I mean, in, in the regular sense, that's, uh, we understand it. Uh, and uh, Ukrainian refugees are just uh, have been sheltered in, at homes. Uh, or in uh, special facilities provided by, by particular uh, towns. It's quite remarkable and, and I think impressive and un with unprecedented scale, I would say, for Poland. So please, the floor is yours, Anja. Um, do I have like an hour for, for an answer for your questions? <laughs> almost. In, ten almost, yeah, okay, great. So three points that I would like to make now. Uh, the, the, the general outlook, uh, what the Russians really want in Ukraine. Please note that I'm going to be saying the Russians because it's not about Putin, it's about Russia. It's Russians. Uh, I've long had this uh, painful conversation because I got a lot of relatives in Russia and Ukraine and I spent a lot of time discussing these painful questions. Um, it is unfortunately about Russians. Uh, the second point, uh, what we do and what we should do. And the third point, uh, the outlook for the future and what we should also, what we should not do, because that's the, the, the equally important. Uh, what the Russians really want in Ukraine now, that's kind of war of annihilation. Putin and his, uh, and to Russia, the Kremlin, they've never recognized Ukraine as a sovereign country. It's always been about Ukraine. It is about Ukraine. It will be about Ukraine. It's never been about NATO. That was kind of Putin bluff, but they, I mean, I really uh, are pretty much, uh, um, a lot of people bought this this Russian bluff. It's always been about Ukraine uh, because uh, Putin. I mean, he, he always was telling us this pretty much straightforward uh, that they want kind of. Um, I mean, he wants he wants kind of new uh, Soviet Union being rebuilt. And we remember uh, when he said that the, the collapse of the Soviet Union was the greatest catastrophe on the of the twentieth century. Uh, so this is uh, so this is about Ukraine, not about NATO. One thing uh, the the plan A was, of course, to capture. Uh, pretty quickly Kyiv and uh, to have a sort of regime change in, in Ukraine. Of course, this didn't fly. Uh, and and now, we, uh, now we are looking for kind of alternative scenarios. Probably that's going to be kind of uh, this, this destroying the Ukrainian statehood as such or trying to divide Ukraine into two. The, 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 the front line probably would be along uh, the Dnieper River. Uh, or trying to capture uh, some Ukrainian territory in the south and east, and then trying to to establish new this quasi uh, People's Republic. We know now that there have been some attempt to establish Kherson People's Republic, uh, kind of uh, similar to the Donetsk and Lugansk. Uh, but this is the thing. I mean, the Russians know that capturing Kiev now would be quite problematic, and they know or they are aware of the fact that they are going to spend some more time in Ukraine that, uh, that, that, that at the very beginning they thought that's going to be. 
so they are trying to, or th th they have been now prepared for uh, for the occupation of the Ukrainian territory. Although at the very beginning, I think that was not the plan. Mm, that the plan was only to capture and then withdraw after the regime changes uh, is done in Kyiv. Um, but anyway, um, if we have the general outlook uh, that probably now the Russian's point is to destroy the Ukrainian statehood as such, uh, now uh, we pretty much can say what we should do uh, in terms of supporting Ukraine. Because uh, I've always, um, I mean, um, I often I often hear uh, that the point is to have a ceasefire in Ukraine. I mean, yes, that's pretty much important to, to not, uh, not to have Ukrainian civilians being killed by the Russians, but I don't really believe that's the point. Uh, the Russian military has to be uh, unfortunately destroyed in Ukraine. The point is that uh, we should not end up with a sort of Minsk free in Ukraine because we know uh, we now remember what happened with Minsk one and Minsk two. And Minsk three means that Russians have only a sort of time to to regroup, uh, uh, to resupply their uh, their military, and then once again to resume uh, the military operation and 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 to go again a uh, bit harky for or key if it doesn't really matter. Uh, but three points uh, in terms of what we should do now uh, to help Ukraine. The first thing is, of course, military uh, military assistance, which means that we should lie, we, we should supply Ukraine with any weapon they want us to supply. So, of course, we have to fight this war because we are into this war. Uh, I know that from, let's say, if we are in Portugal, it could be, I mean, we could say, yeah, that's the that, that's country, but that, that we don't really uh, know much about, and it's pretty much far away. But for example, from Berlin to Ukraine, it's, it's, it's pretty much closer than, than, than uh, let's say, to Italy. So uh, it is, uh, it is uh, I mean, the, the, the consequences are quite direct for, for the European Union and for NATO. Um, I, I heard from Olena about the, the no-fly zone. I find it pretty much problematic now because that's kind of very much uh, offensive instrument rather than defensive one. So we should, um, in I mean, if really I'm to if we are talking about the imposing of no-fly zone in Ukraine, then we have to attack the military targets in U Russian military targets in Ukraine, in Belarus, and in Russia. And we are not going to do that. Uh, that's quite problematic, not only from the po uh, from the political point of view, but also from the military point of view. So, uh, but anyway, um, what is uh, or what, what we consider undoable now could be possible in two weeks or in three weeks, and could be necessary in one month because the situation on the ground changes very quickly, and uh, the political pressure on leaders in Western Europe it could really increase in a couple of weeks and a couple of months. Uh, the wars, sometimes they, they, they take a lot of time. So we don't know whether the war is going to end in a few weeks or in a few months, or maybe in one year, if there's going to be a war of annihilation and a war of attrition, it could take a really lot of time. And we have to be prepared for that. So our weapon supply is one thing for Ukraine. Uh, two, I mean, two, two instruments or two things that are really important now is, of course, air defense. That we should play Ukraine with air defense instruments. And the second one is how to help Ukraine to fight long range missiles and uh, long range artillery strikes. If the Russians are going to fight or if they are going to capture Kyiv or they are going to attempt to capture Kyiv, that's the plan probably. Uh, what, we, what we have seen with Mariupol would be probably repeated uh, along Kyiv. So that's, I mean, that's the thing that we should help Ukrainians fight. Uh, next thing is uh, the economic assistance because these are not only the Russians that uh, that bear the heavy cost of of um, the war now, but the Ukrainians as well. The Ukrainians did really well at the moment, but let's say in a few weeks or in a few months there will be some financial problems with with, with Ukraine. Uh, now the Ukrainian central bank have uh, let's say enough money for two or three months uh, to doing really good business. But the problem is that they have been now cut off from the from the Azov Sea and from the Black Sea by the Russian military, and that sort of uh, the, the the Black Sea um, means that plus um, I, I don't remember the, the, the exact name, but it doesn't really matter. Let's say half of Ukraine export comes through the Black Sea and, and the Azov Sea, so we now have a lot of uh, problems with the Ukrainian international trade. 
this is something that that we need to uh, we need to help Ukraine with because uh, there's going to be kind of change of of the whole international trade routes via land, not via not uh, um, not via uh, um, via seas at the moment. Uh, what we have seen recently, that's quite problematic from my point of view, is that we've done a lot to support Ukraine uh, in terms of financial assistance. But this is, I mean, these are the loans. And what's problematic that we supply Ukraine with financial loans, but they have to repay it in the military. I mean, uh, in the moment when they fight a war, what we now need with, with Ukraine is that we have I mean, we, we, we have to uh, help Ukraine financially directly. I mean, not with the loans. And let's say that we need some kind of um, debt reliefs at the moment. We could, um, I can imagine of the situation that Ukraine has to repay all of the debt and all of the loans after the war, not now. Because at the moment there will there will be kind of financial problems. And uh, although we do not see it now, in a few weeks, uh, they will have to bear the costs of, of, of the war as well. And of course, given that the whole uh, military situation, uh, it, it takes place in Ukraine, not in Russia, we have, to, uh, we have to really have this in mind. The third thing is uh, humanitarian assistance and humanitarian support for Ukraine. We've done a lot. We've done a great job. But then again, please remember that Ukraine was uh, always called this bre breadbasket of Europe. But now, let's say one fourth of the whole black soils and, and soils in Ukraine are out of operation because of the military of the Russian military being in Ukraine. So then, again, in a few weeks' time, where there's going to be summer in Ukraine, there will be a lot of problems with food supply, and that's what we should really have in mind. And we should be prepared for that. I mean, to supply Ukraine with really basic needs in terms of humanitarian assistance. Again, one of the most important, one of the most important points we have to be prepared or let's say we have to bear in mind that the most important focal point in terms of uh, let's say geographically now is polish ukrainian borderland because if the ukrainians are cut off from the border with poland probably we've done i mean we are out of the operation because we could supply of course ukraine during um, let's say along the, the slovakian ukraine or romanian ukrainian border but the most important point is now the Polish Ukrainian borderland. That's what, where, where all these supplies are, are, are coming to Ukraine. Uh, now we've, we've sort of outlook for the future and, and the negotiations. I don't really see a room for compromise between Ukraine and Russia at the moment. My point is that this is only a general Russian bluff, that they are trying to convince the West that there is, let's say, that there is some, uh, some potential for having an agreement between Ukraine and Russia. We saw these uh, articles in the Financial Times and different Western media uh, coming only from the Russian side, not from the Ukrainian side, uh, that they've been negotiating something and there is progress, etc. but there, there is not. My general assessment or my general, uh, uh, my, my pretty much private uh, assessment is that the Russians are bluffing us. I mean, they want us to believe that the agreement is pretty much close. Why? Because they want us to delay the weapons supply to Ukraine. I mean, there are many people saying, yeah, okay, if there is an agreement upcoming, let's not send weapons to Ukraine because that could, let's say, complicate the whole thing, the whole negotiation situation. Uh, they want us to believe that this would complicate the whole thing. Why? They are only buying time. They're only buying time to regroup and then once again to resume the operation. That's the same thing that we saw with the Minsk agreement, the, the first and the second Minsk agreement. That's basically... So we have now a short, very short window uh, of opportunity to supply everything the Ukrainians need. Um, we've wasted one week already, I guess. That's, I mean, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to be offended now, our American friends, but uh, the President Biden announced one week ago the, the new package of weapons supply to Ukraine, one week passed, and they didn't deliver it. Not yet, at least. I, I'm not aware of that. So we wasted one week, probably will waste a couple of days, uh, a couple of next days as well. That's what the Russians want. And at some point, they really, they really win, I mean, over... Um, over this general situation. 
sanctions uh, the last yeah, the, uh, the last, last sentence yes well, you really believe that you will go for one, one hour <laughs> so, yeah, I need okay, to stop you. so okay one sentence on sanctions because uh what's the purpose of the sanctions now it's not a, um it's not about changing the general russian behavior the sanctions now are part of ukrainian negotiation position so we are now trying to increase the Ukrainian diplomatic leverage over Russia. That's the point of sanctions. It's up to them, it's up to the Ukrainians to decide on the terms of the potential agreements. We are not the ones to send Ukrainians, you should do this, you should do that, you should, uh, let's say, I don't know, the concessions on Crimea, on Donbass, etc. It's up to them, and the sanctions are only part of their own leverage against Russia. No lifting of the sanctions unless the Russians withdraw from the whole territory of Ukraine. Very well. Thank you for this uh, first introductory, very important uh, elements. Well, before giving the floor to uh, to Stephen, uh, I would like to uh, make an announcement to our uh, uh, virtual uh, attendees. So, if you would like to uh, make some question and put some comments, you can do it uh, from now uh, within the chat. So, please go ahead if you have a question to a particular uh, uh, panelist or. Uh, some more general question. Go ahead, Stephen. Uh, let's turn to you now. Uh, so I would like to um, uh, most of all ask you about uh, your view on political messaging mes mentioned already by by uh, by Olena around Ukraine's EU's membership applications. What's your take on that? That's the first uh, important question for you. And the second one, knowing your great expertise uh, in European affairs, I would like to ask you. Uh, what is your assessment on how can we confront Putin's regime in short, immediate, in short, uh, and midterm, uh, particularly regarding uh, the, our dependency on Russian uh, fossil fuels? I mentioned Borrell's uh, words, but of course I need to underline that many countries are reluctant to, to this type of, of sanction. It's very problematic and maybe the most vocal word <laughs> was Hungary yesterday, that's the, the red line. So what, what to do with this um, in, uh, facing, as I mentioned, possible uh, use, use of chemical weapons by, by, by Russia. So please go ahead, the floor is yours, Steven. Thank you, Lukas. And um, of course, to, to Pism and uh, the Ukraine think tank liaison office for, for the kind invitation to contribute to the debate. Um, Indeed, I, I would like to take uh, a slightly different angle to, to, the cent to the central question of this morning's event. It, I mean, it, it goes um, by itself to say that, uh, that current operational priorities uh, are, of course, to help Ukraine fight and survive um, and to support you know, the huge and, and growing number of refugees arriving in EU member states. Um, but other than that, uh, th there's more work to be done on the on the EU um, level. I mean, colleagues have already focused uh, a lot on, on the on the issues uh, of more operational concern. So, indeed, let me try and focus on on uh, complementary issues that we need to work on. I mean, on, on the one hand, you have the transatlantic unity in opposing this naked war of aggression. Um, that will require more work in the next weeks and months. We have the summit tree coming up, of course, not just uh, in Brussels. Um, with the European Council and, and the NATO summit at the end of this week, but also on April 1st in a virtual meeting with Xi Jinping, um, with, uh, with Charles Michel and, uh, and Ursula von der Leyen. So a lot of political messaging there is indeed needed, especially to convince uh, our Chinese um, uh, partner and yet rival um, that European attitudes might harden if indeed uh, China is seen to uh, actively help Russia in circumventing EU sanctions. Of course, I mean, these, these punitive sanctions, the delivery of arms and munitions, they've been adopted. Yesterday, the Foreign Affairs uh, Council gave the green light um, to doubling the use of EU funds to 1 billion uh, euro for arming Ukraine and discussion about closing loopholes and the existing sanctions, as well as what you mentioned, the adoption of further sanctions hitting oil and gas imports from Russia will, to my mind, get increasingly difficult uh, for reasons that are well known. Um, what the EU should focus on, to my mind, is really to shore up its strategic uh, gas reserves. Uh, and that could be done 
not just in the ways that have been touted by by ministers and also by the by the energy commissioner uh, so far, but by creating a sort of a European stability mechanism fund uh, or company even, which is established by the EU, which uh, purchases uh, gas and redistributes it to uh, to countries in need. Um, um, yeah, so I mean, there, there is a, a concrete proposal there that uh, that we've developed and, and uh, which can be looked up on the, on the website. But I would like to do, I would like to to focus a little bit more on this political signaling effect on on Ukraine's EU membership application. And so, as a matter of urgency, I think a stronger, uh, positive response to the application is needed. The European Council at uh, Versailles is, of course, given a swift and strategic approach or, or response to, to embrace Ukraine as belonging to the European family, which is essentially a diplomatic formulation found to satisfy reluctant member states of going too fast. Um, effectively, though, what the heads of state and government have done is, is to play for time, uh, so just to resolve their uh, internal disputes. I mean, the, the, the first cracks of divisions which have appeared between them and put the ball in the court of the European Commission. And then we saw reports over the weekend that uh, Commission President von der Leyen reportedly said to, to President Zelensky that the Commission would take several months to, to issue its opinion. Now, when the country is in a war of survival and is partly all occupied by Russian forces, it's, it goes without saying that the normal enlargement procedure sh should be, uh, cannot be applied and should be adapted, uh, to my view. There, there's no legal impediment for the European Commission to depart from its established practice uh, to, you know, compile a 300-page questionnaire and to follow up uh, in a long and arduous uh, bureaucratic process for which the Ukrainian administration simply doesn't have the bandwidth at the moment. So, and I agree with those that, uh, that say that the point of granting candidate status quickly is of paramount importance to signal the EU's fundamental support to a Ukraine which is whole and free, which will be whole and free, and thereby to give hope for a better future that, uh, that can lie ahead. And I would advocate that due uh, to the big investments made since 2014 by Ukraine in implementing the association agreement and the deep and comprehensive free trade arrangements that exist within it, whose chapters, by the way, are the same, as for the existing uh, enlargement process, Ukraine indeed already qualifies for candidate status um, as justified by objective facts. And at SEPS over the last couple of years in projects which have been sponsored by uh, the Swedish International Development Agency, more recently by the European Commission's own DG Trade, uh, following their methodology, We've conducted detailed evidence-based analysis, which shows that at least until four weeks ago, in terms of approximating EU laws and norms, um, the three East European associated states may be ranked alongside the four Western Balkan states that have been granted candidate status, and well ahead uh, of the other two Western Balkan states that uh, have been qualified as potential candidates. So to, to my mind, Ukraine should be fully integrated in the existing enlargement procedures. The snag is, however, that these uh, procedures and the methodology are themselves in need of thorough revision and upgrading. And the enlargement methodology as it exists continues to suffer from this binary in or out type of dialectic uh, that has kept the Western Balkan countries in limbo for years. And uh, the February 2020 revision of that methodology has not generated the momentum that had been expected from it. Um, there is, no, I mean, I'm not advocating to replace it, uh, especially not uh, if the opening of accession talks with Albania and North Macedonia got unstuck, uh, thanks to the lifting of the Bulgarian veto. But the procedure, needs to be improved so as to generate the necessary buy-in of member states in support of reform in applicant countries and assisting the, the European Commission in doing its monitoring job in a much more evidence-based, quantified manner. And 
It is here that in cooperation with the Belgrade-based think tank EPC, uh, Sepsis published late last year a proposal advocating a process of staged accession to the European Union, which foresees the introduction of clearly marked and conditioned uh, steps towards membership with larger benefits in terms of structural funding, in terms of inclusion uh, of uh, applicant countries, administrations, members of parliament in the functioning of EU bodies and institutions, which was hitherto not foreseen in uh, the process or only at a very late stage. This, um, we think, should afford uh, both the political status and, and produce tangible rewards for reform, thus tying uh, candidate countries into a, a more genuine uh, pre-accession process, um, at the same time providing for regress procedures in case of black backsliding on, on key indicators, as we've seen in Serbia, for example, uh, does alleviating fears among certain member states, uh, member state capitals of adding new veto players uh, around the decision-making table of the council. And what we've done is we, we've essentially sounded out government officials in Western Balkan countries. We've toured capitals of EU member states, most notably in Paris, both at the Elysee, at the Quai d'Orsay, in, in Berlin, at the Bundeskanzleramt, uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, The Hague, Vienna, Stockholm, etc., where that proposal has been met with cautious optimism, in, in certain cases, enthusiasm. And we think that this proposal deserves now more consideration by the EU institutions and member states like Poland in the interests of both Ukraine, as well as the uh, Western Balkan and the other Eastern European states that uh, are either already tied into the process or that have applied for EU membership. And that should tie Ukraine in, in particular in the process, which is guided by a firm prospect of EU membership. And for that, the Commission should issue its opinion fast and put the ball back in the court where it belongs, that of the member states. They uh, need to have the political courage to see their commitments made at Versailles through to grant candidate country status to Ukraine as 11 uh, countries of Central and Eastern European, uh, Central Europe have already called for, of course. And that decision, uh, of course, comes at, at no additional cost to the burden of Ukraine and member states that they are already carrying at the moment. And it, it underlines the commitment of the EU to the free choice of, uh, of Ukraine and its citizens to determine the future course of, uh, of their country. Um, so that, that would be my, my um, uh, answer to the question, you know, what's needed? Of course, humanitarian support, provision of weapons and munitions, this has been described. I would add candidate, uh, candidate country status immediately, certainly not later than the European Council Summit in, in June. And then for the post-war situation, of course, a, mass, a massive uh, reconstruction and development program uh, should be prepared a return to the DCFTA agenda and staged accession. But perhaps as a parting uh, thought and perhaps more uncomfortable to our Ukrainian um, uh, friends, let me say this, um, we need to think about what will change in Ukraine as a result of the war in political, economic and societal terms. And it may seem premature and, and you know, far away from the immediate priorities as of now, but we have to bear in mind that uh, already in 1943, 1944, so well before the end of World War II, both in the UK and in the US, serious work was, was being done on post-war uh, scenarios. And of course, this would best concern more Russia itself, and what should happen in the post-Putin uh, era, then a vict victorious Ukraine, one might argue, but still the shock, the huge shock and the trauma of war will have consequences on Ukraine and on its society. And the question is, of what kind? And this is where some of our work should also focus. So with that, thanks uh, for the opportunity again, uh, Lukács and uh, Nolena. But Stephen, for your uh, very interesting uh, contribution, this uh, stage accession uh, mode process, uh, 
uh, seems very interesting and it's not on it's advocacy with evidence based uh, basis so so thank you for 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 your for your input uh, let's move to uh, to boris um uh, you have this also luxury to to be able to react to the, all what was said uh, until now. Uh, we are very interested in um, your lecture regarding the state of play of EU support uh, for Ukraine and what can we expect more uh, uh, to come. Uh, of course, uh, one of uh, the other key questions is also regarding to how to design this uh, direct uh, short and long-term uh, policy toward uh, Russia. Please, Boris, uh, uh, the voice of uh, practitioner, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you. Yes, it works, yes? Yeah, it works. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. I think it's extremely interesting for me as well. And I would like to thank you and uh, the liaison office uh, for organizing this event, also for providing us uh, regularly with information on uh, the situation on the ground. Um, a lot has already been said. Um, I would like to uh, to add that uh, we stand uh, fully uh, with Ukraine. Uh, it has been made clear uh, since the 24th of, uh, of February, but even before. Uh, we signed uh, an association agreement, which was already uh, mentioned, and uh, we know that uh, Ukraine has uh, chosen a European path many years ago. And uh, the fact that uh, last week or two weeks ago in Versailles, uh, we have recognized the European aspirations of uh, Ukraine, I think it's a big, big step that we should not underestimate. I've been dealing with a couple of Eastern Partnership summits, uh, dealing with a final statement. And I remember that this uh, point of European aspiration was also a very difficult one to be negotiated with our EU member states. So I think it's a big step that, uh, that uh, of course, opened the way for uh, the recognition uh, of Ukraine as a, as a candidate, um, candidate country in the future. Um, I listened very carefully to what was said by, uh, by Stephen, um, and uh, so far there is no fast track to, to join the EU, but uh, let's hope that uh, we, we might be creative in that, in that respect. I know that my, my colleagues in the European Commission are, are working very actively on this assessment, and uh, indeed what has been achieved under the association agreement and the deep and comprehensive free trade agreement is already a building block in this, uh, in this accession process. Uh, we already said that uh, uh, the EU support to Ukraine has been massive. I take the point that uh, there are loans, of course, but there are also a lot of grants uh, there are also emergency packages by the BRD. Uh, so uh, we are mobilizing a number of IFIs, the European Investment Bank as well. Uh, we have achieved a lot of progress in some files, uh, which, uh, which we would not have seen, thought about before, like the connection of the electric electricity grid uh, of Ukraine to, to the European grid. Sounds very technical, but it's a big, big, uh, big, big step, which was not expected before years, and we achieved it in, uh, in, a, in, in some weeks. Uh, you already mentioned this military support, the doubling of uh, our contribution uh, to the European peace facility from 500 to uh, 1, billion, 1 billion euros. I also fully agree that the war started actually in 2014, and uh, let's not forget that 14,000 people have been killed since uh, since 14 and until the end of uh, of February uh, in eastern uh, Ukraine. Uh, I would like also to remind that actually already in 2008 uh, there was a war between uh, Russia and Georgia, with also. Um, occupation of some of the uh, Georgian territories, and we might fear that Republic of Moldova, but also Georgia, might be next uh, uh, and might be also a target uh, for for Russia. Um, you mentioned challenge to the European uh, security. I think it's a challenge to the international order. Uh, we 
by a nuclear power, which is uh, uh, dramatic. And we do a lot also uh, to reach uh, uh, third countries at the UN level, because it's uh, not only European issue, uh, it's a, a worldwide issue. Uh, and it's a, a dramatic challenge to the UN Charter, to all the uh, UN principles. And you know that uh, we are putting tremendous efforts together with like-minded countries to isolate Russia as much as possible in uh, international fora. Uh, there was uh, a vote in the UN General Assembly on uh, a resolution on, uh, on the war which was uh, very broadly supported. Um, uh, we know we are supporting now Ukraine-sponsored resolution on the humanitarian situation in, uh, uh, in, in the country. So um, we, we do a lot and we have, a, together with uh, United States, UK, a number of other partners, we have a, a list of international uh, organizations where Russia should be isolated and where Russia is currently uh, condemned, isolated, or simply expelled or excluded. Um, and uh, also there are a number of uh, international positions where Russian candidates have applied that we are, uh, we are blocking now. Uh, we, we said a lot about, about sanctions. Uh, we have four packages uh, by now adopted since the 24th of February. Uh, we have a fifth package uh, in preparation, which has not been adopted yet indeed, but we are ready to, to do more. And these sanctions are unprecedented. I think I've never seen such, uh, such hard hitting um, sanctions, which, uh, which through will have a mid, mid term impact. I mean, it's not an immediate impact, but it's clear that uh, the objective is to have Russia seize its military actions and withdraw all forces and military equipment from the entire territory of Ukraine. That's, that, are, that is one of the preconditions to uh, lift the sanctions. So most probably the sanctions will stay for long. We know that they have a very uh, tough impact on the Russian economy. Uh, basically, um, blocking, uh, isolating Russia in terms of financial uh, uh, um, uh, support in terms of uh, trade. And uh, we know that we have, or we are withdrawing the most favored uh, nation status uh, from Russia. So losing, uh, depriving Russia from the benefits of the WTO membership. I guess uh, the next step by Russia would be a withdrawal from the WTO. We'll see what uh, uh, the State Duma will, uh, will decide. I, I would not agree that we are uh, against uh, Russians. Uh, it's true that part of the Russian population supports um, the operation or the war. But uh, we must... 70% they are opposed. Sorry? More than 70% they are opposed. Two thirds, but I, I, I think really one third, uh, to, to my, uh, my, my, uh, my understanding, one third is really behind. I think one third is probably afraid to, uh, to express its view, and uh, one third is, is really opposed to the war. I mean, uh, but of course, uh, there is a huge state uh, propaganda. Uh, I mean, a real brain wash, washing on, um, on uh, the state uh, media, TV, it's incredible. And uh, we know that access to independent, open information is almost closed now. Uh, all the uh, international media have, have left. Uh, the latest is Euronews now will be closed. I think it was the last uh, kind of uh, international channel operating in Russia. It will be closed, closed soon or already closed. Uh, and uh, all the independent media, uh, I mean, TV, Dost, uh, Echa Moskvi, they've all been closed. Only Nova Gazeta tries to survive. It's uh, the last, I would say, independent newspaper, uh, but uh, it's extremely difficult. So um, we still try and we will continue to try uh, to reach Russian citizens, to explain our policy that uh, our, our sanctions are there to stop the war, to uh, stop the military actions. Uh, we will try and continue uh, 
exchange programs in the field of education uh, to, to try to work with youth. I think it's a wish of our member states to continue that uh, because we, we we cannot just cut all all the links with uh, with uh, uh, any and uh, any, any Russian. So. I know it's extremely difficult, uh, but we still believe in diplomacy. Our political masters, President Macron, uh, Chancellor Scholz, are keeping contacts with uh, with Putin, and it's extremely difficult because to negotiate you need to be two. And uh, we know that uh, Russia has been uh, of extremely bad face, to say the least, uh, uh, lying. So it's uh, it's more and more difficult, also in 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 light of the. The crimes which are committed uh, every day uh, in uh, in Ukraine, but uh, even if there is only a, a thin hope, I think that negotiations should be pursued uh, between Ukraine and, uh, and and Russia. I think, uh, um, uh, and we know that uh, there are third countries uh, ready to help. Uh, Turkey, Israel are trying. Uh, I think the UN could do more, uh, for instance, to to have. Uh, uh ceasefires even local ceasefires so uh, we we still believe that diplomacy uh, could achieve achieve something uh about the future uh extremely difficult to say uh but i definitely agree that uh, we will need to think about uh post-war scenarios vis-a-vis -vis ukraine vis-a-vis -vis russia uh, for us, it's also extremely important to work with third countries uh, which are affected by sanctions. Uh, we, we mentioned the food supply, food security. I mean, a number of countries will be affected about what's happening uh, in, in Ukraine. Uh, we should avoid, uh, of course, third countries circumventing um, uh, sanctions. It applies to Central Asia, for instance, uh, to, uh, to China, and China is a is of course a, a, a big uh, a big question mark these days, and uh, a lot of uh, efforts are put by like-minded the US by us to to try to convince China to join at least the condemnation and to, uh, if possible, to uh, not to to help uh, uh, Russia in, in any way. So I don't have answers today. I have a lot of question marks, and that's why for me it's extremely interesting also to. Uh, to listen uh, about uh, about uh, what was said and about the, the questions. Uh, we are also working on the Eastern Partnership, which is a concept uh, very important to Poland and other EU member states, what to do with the Eastern Partners. Belarus is already under sanctions. Armenia is uh, uh, in the hands of, uh, of Russia. Azerbaijan is not clear. Uh, Georgia, Moldova, uh, Ukraine are now uh, on the European uh, path. So does it still make sense to have an Eastern partnership framework or should we design something new? So a lot of questions we are working on. Uh, and um, as, as I said, I mean, uh, we will continue to fully stand with Ukraine. Uh, there are difficult questions about what to do next in terms of sanctions and there are intense debate within the European Union. Um, but uh, we are ready to uh, to respond by by further questions uh, uh, because we see no no uh, ending to the escalation on the ground in France on the Russian side and uh, the worst might uh, still come. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, thank you, Boris. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Be before giving the floor to, to the larger public, um, we are very keen to hear your comments and questions. Just to react, because uh, that was my fault. You know, I asked you this question about the uh, uh, mid and long term um, policy toward Russia. Uh, I think we all agreed uh, on the on the direct needs how to support Ukraine, in particular military. But uh, I'm 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 uh, uh, I'm mostly convinced that uh, there is an important um, uh, support by Russian society to this war. I've been working on a civil society in Russia for a few years as a researcher, and we uh, we can not only uh, we don't have to count only on some polls that can be not so so relevant. Yeah, but we, we can't see uh, anti-war demonstrations. There are some, and this is very brave people who demonstrate in Russia now against uh, this war. But 
uh, this is uh, this is uh, also a fact that we don't have this uh, uh, this um, this huge mobilization of, of uh, important uh, relevant from mobilization from from Russian society against this uh, uh, we can now state it the more and more war crimes that uh, happen in, in Ukraine and we'll see what will happen next uh, uh, when Russia is has been radicalized itself, uh, not achieving direct military goals. Uh, there are many Russians that have left the country, dozens of thousands, maybe even more. Uh, and, and then uh, that's also the question, which is one of our uh, virtual attendees question, uh, how to communicate with the Russian uh, society. So you mentioned it, that we would like to do it, uh, we are aiming to do it, but how to do it now? The propaganda has worked for, for years, and I think it's it's proved to be quite uh, successful, referring to my, my, my first point. But I will leave the, uh, the floor to our public. So we have some questions from uh, virtual attendees, but we need to uh, take advantage of your presence here and your effort you made to come here. So please go ahead. Who would like to uh, ask questions, uh, make comments? Please, before doing that, please represent yourself. Uh, my name is uh, Dmitry Shkurko, National News uh, Agency of Ukraine. Uh, it's obviously that uh, diplomacy should play its role in uh, the conflict resolution. But right now we have a key question. Uh, what the negotiations should be held about? So what would be a topic? That's why I want to ask uh, Elena. Uh, you mentioned absolutely rightly, and I agree that uh, uh, the only way for Ukraine to survive is to get uh, uh, to prevail to to get some kind of victory in that fight. But uh, what is the definition for a victory for Ukrainians? This is an important question because uh, it looks like uh, even if we will stuck on uh, the liberation of all occupied territories, including the Crimea, it would not solve the issue if the Russia would not changed. You see. Uh, it will postpone war for some time, but uh, uh, you know the war will come back sooner or later. So that what is the uh, definition of victory for yourself, and what kind of referenda and questions President Zelensky want to ask the Ukrainian people uh, about uh, the uh, future negotiations with uh, with Russia? If you know the answer, of course, to that question and. Uh, for our European uh, friends, uh, it's uh, we, we all know some kind of uh, division inside EU on the position of, uh, for example, energy. So that my question is pretty simple. Uh, I don't know how here in Europe, but there in Ukraine, we see all the sign of uh, absolutely Nazi and fascist uh state appearing in inside russia so that if you are going to continue the trade uh, uh, in energy field with russia what conditions of coexistence between the uh, modern west and uh, putin's russia still existing uh in uh, this uh, world thank you so much okay thank you so much uh, indeed uh, what I suggest, just to take one more question, and then I will leave you to, to respond. Uh, yes, thank you so much. I will be, be very quick. I'm Frederick Moreau. I'm a lawyer here at the Bar of Brussels and a research associate at IRIS in Paris. My question is very simple. What should the Europeans do if tomorrow or in a week time, uh, Mr. Putin uh, used the chemicals uh, weapons or the uh, a small tactical a nuclear bomb? What should we do? Thank you, Frederick. Uh, Olena, let's start with you again, please. The floor is yours. Thank you, Dmitro, for the questions. I would like to answer the following way. If Ukraine gets Crimea, it would mean uh, the death of the Putin regime. It is clear as that. If we manage to fully restore our territorial integrity, it would mean the death of the Russian regime. Because for Putin, Crimea means uh, him being in power. He loses Crimea, he loses power. That's it. That is why I insist on military uh, win of uh, Ukraine in this war. 
because it creates a, a moral trigger for elites, for the population that he has lost. Putin did not bring what he has promised to these people. That's it. And that is why we need to insist and come to your second question on referendum. Uh, we know, right, we Ukrainians, we took uh, the promise not criticizing uh, publicly the authorities in times of war, and we keep our word. But it doesn't mean that we stopped monitoring the actions or intentions of the authorities. And this uh, referendum in times of war, it's one of those intentions which we need to keep a very close eye on and uh, to make it very clear that now the Ukrainian authorities have full capacities in their hands to make decisions. And I already listed the conditions in which can be, con uh, can be considered as the victory of Ukraine. And no referendum on successions or any other decisions in terms of giving any preferences to Russia can be held. And we must be very clear about this. And this is, by the way, this is our job of Ukrainians to keep a very close eye on this and to alarm on any processes which we see may go against the interest of uh, Ukraine. So thank you for the questions. and. Uh, we will win. Daniel, the floor is yours. <clears throat> I, would, I would change the perspective a bit. So um, the question on what would be the Ukrainian victory uh, is quite problematic for me. So I mean, it, the, the, our end goal should be to deny the Russians victory in Ukraine. If we deny the Russians to achieve the political goals in Ukraine, that's actually the Ukrainian win. So uh, they cannot change the Ukrainian political system and they cannot capture more Ukrainian territory. I mean, that's that, that's the basic thing. And if, if, if we deny the Russians victory in Ukraine, then we have the Ukrainian victory as well. Derived from that, we got the, the point on the negotiations. I think that the shuttle diplomacy with Moscow should immediately be stopped i mean there is a president putin cherry picking different western leaders and then playing one against the other i'm i'm, I'm not gonna talking let's say with the polish president because i can talk to the, the french one yeah? or to the, to the chancellor of germany it brought no results we should be helping ukraine and it's up to president putin it's up to the russians to call us i mean we have to Let's say we have to create the situation in which these are the Russians that need to talk to us. That's why I mean, saying if we deny the Russians victory in Ukraine, then at some point they would have to create for themselves this kind of face saving option. And Putin was given so many face saving options and he was never interested in that. And we are still looking for some face saving options for him and he's still not interested in that. We saw it in Mariupol, in Kharkiv, in Kyiv. We're still thinking about, I mean, we, we've been more thinking about Putin and Russia than about the future of Ukraine. And about the future of Ukraine. I don't think we, at least some of us, will not like it because there's gonna be a fortress Ukraine in the future. I see no other option. There's gonna be kind of Israeli, military state in Ukraine, because even after the war, uh, th th there will be, of course, the, the war trauma in Ukraine as well, but there were many, many voices even before the war, uh, before 2014, saying that the Russians are there, Russia is there, Russia is here to stay, and they have to be prepared that this is a long-term threat to the Ukrainian existence, to the existence of the Ukrainian state as such, and they have to be prepared to fight this long-term threat. So now, after the war, we will have a really militarized state in Ukraine. I see no other option. That's called, we can call it Fortress Ukraine, no matter what, but, but I mean, that's, that's be the end goal in Ukraine after the war. Uh, and some of us would not like it, I believe. Uh, there was this point, um, again, um, whether there could be some kind of compromise reached with the Russians. Um, we've been looking for a win-win scenario in Ukraine for a long time. Uh, I don't think it is possible because the Russians don't see it this way. So uh, for President Putin and for the Kremlin, the basic scenario is the full subordination of Ukraine. 
if they cannot achieve it, probably day by day now they're they are coming to the understanding that it is not possible. The second preferred option by the Russians is to destroy the Ukrainian statehood. So there is no win-win scenario, although we I mean we can look for that, but it's not existed, it's it's non-existent in the U in the Russian way of thinking about Ukraine. What the Russians think about Ukraine is uh, if I I mean now I'll be quoting, let's say President Putin. So what he thinks is either I control Ukraine in its entirety fully, or there is no Ukraine at all. That's what we saw, that's what we have seen in Mariupol now. What 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 the President Putin is doing, what he's saying. Uh, what, what, the, what the Russian military is doing in Ukraine. So either they control Ukraine fully or there is no Ukraine. So again, what we have to do and what would be the, Ukra the Ukrainian victory to deny the Russians victory in Ukraine. Steven, your turn, and then Boris. Thank you, Lukas, and uh, for the question as to divisions within the European Union. Of course, on trade, um, <laughs> Decoupling is, is in progress and um, both the European Commission and individual member state governments have um, issued plans to speed up basically um, the differentiation of their energy resource intake uh, so as to become independent from, uh, from uh, Russian gas and oil uh, supplies. Um, I think the next winter, um, you know, provide us with a thermometer, uh, pun intended, uh, to to gauge European resilience uh, in this field, not just in, in Germany, but especially in, in the Baltic states and in the other EU member states that are 100%, have been 100% um, dependent on, on Russian gas. Now, the visions on um, the future um, Nazi state of Russia and what conditions of coexistence um, would, uh, would have to be formulated uh, then. I think it's already clear now that uh, the EU's uh, Russia strategy, I mean, it's not really a strategy, it's, it's rather five guiding uh, principles developed by Mogherini in 2016, um, that that approach is clearly at an inflection point. Um, of the five priority uh, areas, the Minsk process is dead. Now, uh, perhaps the greatest irritant um, uh, is, of course, the status of Russia's near abroad, the, the shared slash contested uh, neighborhood. And this issue intersects with several unresolved questions, uh, resulting, of course, from uh, Soviet Union's collapse, which uh, Mr. Putin has been advocating quite adamantly, um, but which also have, of course, antecedents across centuries of Russian political thought. Yeah, what are the boundaries of, uh, of the Russian world? Um, what privileges flow from, uh, from Russia's claims to great power uh, status and, and who gets to write the rules governing the European security system? I mean, there it's clear that Putin has no role whatsoever. Uh, he's he's uh, proven himself to be a pathological liar who cannot be uh, trusted. Um, in the other field, selective cooperation uh, in the future, fortress Russia, Nazi fortress Russia, uh, seems out of the question as long as, as Putin sits in, uh, in the Kremlin uh, and, and the EU's ability, therefore, to develop closer relations uh, with civil society um, will not only prove more difficult uh, in an increasingly totalitarian Russia, but also risk further escalating tension with um, that totalitarian regime that is trying to ensure its survival. So, well, continued isolation of regime of the regime is obviously um, in that scenario, the, uh, the one option or the, the main condition, whether containment is really possible will depend on, on China uh, to a great extent. And, uh, and, and however, you know, the, the geopolitical forces that have been unleashed by Russia's war of aggression against uh, Ukraine will, will settle over the next um, uh, months, if not years. Whether uh, the EU collective will be able to actually mobilize the support to resistance within Russia is, I think, again, prone to the type of divisions that, uh, that we've talked uh, about before. Um, 
So I'm, I'm rather I'm rather skeptical, of course, uh, of of such a scenario of coexistence as is uh, as been framed in the question. Uh, I think it will be um, yeah parallel lives uh, that will have to be led in, in that scenario. Stephen, thank you. Um, I can see your engagement. Just, just a second. Uh, there are several questions from from our virtual attendees uh, here. Uh, there, there is the will to to ask questions to engage. Thank you. I'm very thankful for, for that. But before we turn to the second round of questions, Boris, please your turn. Yes, thank you. I think uh, Ukraine has won uh, to some extent, morally, uh, if not military yet. Uh, so it's a total uh, Russian failure. I mean, uh, that's clear. So it's a defeat for Russia on all, uh, all fronts. Um, so that's about, about the, the victory. Of course, uh, the war, the invasion is not over yet, and we'll see how the situation evolves on the ground. But uh, I would say I'm rather optimistic on the, on the, on the outcome. Um, I would avoid uh, the terms of fascist, Nazi, about, about Russia. I think we should not fall in the Russian trap by accusing the other of, of Nazi and uh, all these kind of things. It's an uh, authoritarian uh, and pretty much totalitarian regime. Uh, but not, not, let's not uh, misuse um, historical terms here. I would also... Uh, <clears throat> be more careful about uh, personalization. I mean, it's a system. Uh, so, uh, of course, everybody uh, is uh, focusing on the president, but uh, even if he goes, I mean, I'm not sure we'll get uh, something better uh, instead. So it's really a system that uh, needs to be, uh, to be changed. And uh, as uh, it was said, I mean, uh, that's uh, what we, we, we try to achieve uh, with this uh, uh, economic uh, economic uh, um, uh, economic sanctions and what will happen on the ground. But it's not up to us to change the Russian regime. I mean, it's up to, to the Russians to 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 decide about about their future. Um, about uh, trade restrictions, I think we have shown. Uh, so far, huge unity and unprecedented unity. There is also a dynamics with like minds G7 and so on. So if needed, I think we will come to more uh, sanctions, including in the oil, gas and coal sector. And uh, of course, I cannot uh, prejudge how, what will be our reaction to the use of uh, chemical weapons uh, or tactical nuclear weapons. It's more a question to military experts, but I think we are ready to, uh, to, to go further into sanctions if, uh, if it happens. So that's clear. And we know that there will be a price to pay for our citizens, for, for Europe. But I think we have uh, demonstrated so far that we are ready uh, for that. And uh, I, I, I really believe that uh, our unity, uh, solidarity will, uh, will, will continue. And uh, finally, there was, a, I think, a question how to reach Russians. I mean, we are uh, using, uh, uh, trying and starting using uh, social networks, uh, uh, <coughs> Russian social networks. As we know, Facebook, Instagram have been declared as extremists closed, uh, internet might be, might be closed one day or switch to a Russian uh, net. But we are, we are working, I cannot say everything now, but uh, we are working on, on reaching uh, citizens using uh, national Russian social media. Thank you, Boris. So we continue privilege, privileging uh, the, the in-person presence. So please uh, uh, ask your question and then we move to the most interesting one uh, from uh, from the virtual attendees. The microphone, please. Yeah. Merci. Thank you very much. Iskra Kirov, I'm with the Open Society Foundations. And I'd like to pick up on this question of the membership application. Indeed, the, um, the uh, European leaders in Versailles missed a historic opportunity. This could have been the moment when uh, they jointly declare that Ukraine, Georgia, and Moldova have a European membership perspective and that one day they will become members. It would have cost very little. It would have sent a very important political message. 
Instead, we have a somewhat tepid declaration and we, the, the words of individual leaders after the summit to fill it with more meaning and to give it more ambition. So that opportunity was lost. And now we are, we are at the stage of this bureaucratic process that does give, uh, I think, as Stephen mentioned, uh, member states the opportunity to hide behind it. It could take a very long time. And any kind of modeling from the EU side on this, of course, sends a very, very negative message. Um, giving a membership perspective would have done very little to actually aggravate the conflict any further. Putin already showed he feels he has a free hand, but giving a negative signal or not giving a conclusive signal, uh, an indication of, of where the countries are headed and the future relationship with the EU, of course, is very negative and, and, and gives further credit to, to Putin's words that the EU actually is not committed uh, to these three countries and, and to Ukraine truly. So I guess my question is now with, with what we have, with the uh, preparation of the questionnaire, the opinion of the commission, what, I, I know we don't have a representative of the commission here, but perhaps to Mr. Yaroshevich and, and, and to Stephen, what are the options to speed things up? Uh, Ukraine has already been assessed uh, within the implement, implementation of the association agreement. There have been several big sectoral assessments. Are there options that the questionnaire could be uh, a, a sort of a condensed version, something that can be prepared more quickly? And how could also Ukraine be supported in, in engaging with the EU and with the Commission on this in these times of war? Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, two questions, the most interesting um, uh, from the usual attendees. Uh, first one, complex one, so please concentrate. Uh, does the EU address Russia? as first option, the current ruling regime minority, the second, the Russian people influenced by the current ruling regime majority, or the third option, the Russian people non-supportive to the current ruling regime minority rejected by the previous two groups. The first question and the second one um, uh, regarding the Ukrainian diaspora. We see that the Ukrainian diaspora refugees do a lot to support the defense uh, war effort. How to imagine the situation and possibilities of Ukrainians inside Russia? As I know, by the uh, 2010 uh, Russian census, we are talking nearly 2 million Ukrainians living there. Is that a hostage repression policy challenge or is that a resistant disruption protest potential? An honest question. Go ahead. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's honest question. As from the beginning, uh, Olena, please let, let's let's begin uh, tradition. I would probably take this uh, Ukraine diaspora inside of uh, Ukraine, uh, inside of Russia. I saw this question in uh, the screen, so here is my thoughts. Um, we do not know. Uh, we do not have uh, knowledge or expertise about what are their feelings uh, or what are their understanding uh, about the war of Russia in uh, Ukraine. Do they see it as a war of Russia or do they see it as a special operation or don't they see at all uh, what is happening? Because as you may know, many Ukrainians do have relatives in Russia and uh, what has happened since the beginning of this stage of war uh, many of these uh, connections have been cut because of uh, we understood that this is a clear misunderstanding, complete misunderstanding or alternative picture in their mind. And that's why we do not know whether they, they themselves continue, continue to consider themselves Ukrainian or not. And if uh, this division in their minds exists, we do not know. So my message would be and my outcome of this is that again and again, this job, unfortunately, has to be done by Ukrainian, uh, by Ukrainians and the citizens and the countries of the free world. If, if any, any uh, opposition or any uh, movements inside of Russia will raise, which will help to uh, to get rid of this regime, and I do agree, I do agree that this is a system. We just call it uh, Putin system, but it is a Russian system. So if anything uh, appraise uh, inside of Russia, let's take it as a, a nice bonus 
but not more, but do not count on this. And again and again, let's mobilize our resources to help Ukraine, our main battlefield here now in Ukraine. And absolutely what we do need is to help Ukraine in military terms, in financial terms, in ammunition, in uh, support and fuels, in everything to win the war and to help Ukraini Ukrainians to resist and to mobilize the free world, because we do understand the consequences of the sanctions on uh, citizens and countries of the free world, right? And let's focus on those who really can make impact and who really make uh, victory. This is, would be my main uh, thought about uh, everything connected to the Russians or Ukrainians or Russian population and so on and so on. Thank you. Jotan. Okay, those three general points. <clears throat> Point number one is um, I've been always critical about the, the European Union, but this time I will be kind of uh, more optimistic. So we, we've really we've really done a great job, but that's not a time for self congratulations. I mean, there will be time for that, but, but not not now. We have to uh, we have to support Ukraine pretty fast because once again there is a small window of opportunity now before the Russians again resumes. The military offensive. That's point number one. Um, point number two about um, about the Russians or, uh, or or Russia in general. Um, I don't think that our priority now is to take care about the Russian population or, or the Russians. One of the uh, one of the points of pressure, one of the instruments that we have on putting on the Russian regime is the Russian society, and yep. This kind of smart sanctions, smart sanctions. Um, that's one of the reasons that we have. I mean, I call it the Russian collective irresponsibility. We created it in, in Russia because of the smart sanctions. We took care so much of the Russian society that they now subscribe to the, the, the Putin's to the regime's view about Ukraine and about the war uh, against Ukraine. Now is not the time to take care about Russians. We have to impose several costs on the system. Uh, on the Russian society, it's up to them, of course, to to uh, um, stand against the system. But that's one of the, I mean, that's one of the point, points or, or one of the instruments that we have against the Russian, uh, the Russian, the, the, the Russian regime, the society, the Ukrainians taking taking up arms. That's the second point, and and the third one is, of course, the international, the international reaction to the Russians. Uh, and uh, point number three, I'm. Um, uh, I would be probably criticized about it. Um, and uh, I mean, on, on Ukraine joining the European Union, um, I think there is there is a possibility to speed the whole process a bit. But at the end of the day, the Ukraine will have to negotiate the terms of its membership in the European Union. And I, I don't think that the Ukrainian negotiating position now is pretty much strong. So what I'm afraid of is that some EU member states would like to take this opportunity rather to negotiate the terms of Ukrainian membership that would not be so much favorable to the Ukrainians. We saw it with the EU association agreement at some point that then after a few years, the Ukrainians were rather complaining that the terms of the agreement are not in line with the current situation. So I would be very much in favor of granting Ukraine the candidate status. But then again, with the negotiations, I would not speed it up. Let's focus on situation on the ground. Let's, let's help Ukraine fight the Russian invasion. Then there will be time for the negotiations because now at the moment it could be actually to the detriment of the Ukrainian interest. Steven, please, the floor is yours. Your turn. Yeah, perfect segue to uh, to the question uh, that I wanted to address, of course, on the membership uh, application, uh, and especially the Commission's leeway in um, in facilitating a faster process. I mean, indeed, extraordinary times require extra extraordinary solutions, and so. The Geopolitical Commission uh, should own up to its self-declared uh, status and, and meet this moment fast. Um, and as been mentioned, uh, based on the ongoing assessments um, of the implementation of the uh, DCFTA, the association agreement writ large, 
helped by Ukrainian government office, um, which said that it would publish on its website um, this week already, the 2021 implementation report uh, with, with its track record, the commission should be able to issue a short uh, political avis in the next month or two, at least in time for the June European Council uh, to decide uh, among member states on granting candidate country status. That indeed would not mean opening accession talks. That would only happen when circumstances allow. And of course, first, the war would have to, um, would have to be won. Um, and the stage accession process building on the DCFTA um, would have to come with a massive um, reconstruction uh, package, funding package. Um, so un until then, um, you know, no concrete movement on the enlargement track uh, would, be, uh, would be taken. If and when in that moment comes, it would be in a staged process as we've advocated. Um, but now of utmost importance is indeed that, that political courage that ought to be mustered between member states to, uh, to grant uh, Ukraine and its citizens, uh, its fighters, basically the concrete prospect of EU membership. Uh, yes, very briefly. Uh, on the membership, I don't think that the candidate status would have changed anything, unfortunately. Uh, I still believe that NATO is much more of a red flag, uh, the potential accession of, uh, of Ukraine and so on. Uh, and then Georgia to, to NATO is really a trigger to me. And uh, we have seen it in 2008 uh, in the Russian-Georgian war. Uh, I will convey the message uh, to my colleagues, of course, uh, to, to see, uh, to be creative, innovative, and uh, to see how to speed up, uh, speed up the process. Um, uh, but uh, it will take a, a long time anyway. I mean, of course, to, to, join, uh, to join the EU. Uh, and let's not forget Moldova and Georgia, who are also in the, in the same train now. Uh, it will take years, uh, years and years, uh, as we know. But the, the perspective would be a, a great step, uh, indeed. <clears throat> on uh, on the uh, on, on Russia, I mean the the, ta the sanctions are targeting the the power circles, uh, the inner circle of, of the power of the regime, uh, oligarchs, uh, state oligarchs, and so on. And that's very clear, but all the citizens are affected. I mean, we are talking about GDP falls this year of 20, 30 percent, and uh, and any every Russian uh, feels that uh, that situation is bad. I mean, so it's not that uh, uh, we are not uh, touching uh, touching ordinary citizens, but our main target in, when it comes to sanction remains uh, the decision makers and those who bear responsibility for, for the war. The people who support, I think we, we try to, to inform them. Uh, the people who support uh, the war in Russia, we try to inform them and we'll try to do so. And uh, we will work on uh, disinformation and so on. And those who are not supporting, we're helping them too. I mean, we, uh, we are, it was said that 200,000 Russians uh, have left, uh, have left uh, Russia, the most creative uh, people. Uh, there is a real brain drain to Armenia, Georgia, Kyrgyzstan, and so on. Uh, let's not forget about Navalny today, who might get another term of uh, 10 or 13 or 15 years of prison on a fabricated case. And we will issue a, a statement on that and we will continue to, to fight. For, for, for human rights in, uh, in Russia. Of course, the pity that Russia has, has, has been withdrawn or expelled from the Council of Europe or has left uh, first, because that will uh, limit uh, the possibility for the Russian citizen to, to go to the European Court of, of Human Rights. But so we have a differentiated approach, I would say, uh, to respond to, the, to this uh, internet question. Uh, when it comes to the regime, people who support or tacitly support the war and those who are against it. We have run of time. Um, our debate has uh, reached its end. So um, thank you so much. Uh,
Dear panelists, first of all, uh, for your contributions, for accepting our invitation. Really, it was a very interesting and fascinating discussion, uh, very constructive uh, in, in many in many parts. Um, Oren, I will give you the, the, the floor also to, to, to farewell our, um, our guests. Uh, thank you for coming here uh, and thank you for your engagement, for your questions. The same for the virtual uh, attendees. Uh, I hope that we continue our cooperation with our Ukrainian partners. Uh, uh, unfortunately, you know, we, the war is still on and, and we will continue uh, taking that into account Ukrainian perspective and uh, uh, debating, uh, advocating uh, um, the, the end of, of, this, uh, of this dramatic situation in, in Ukraine. Uh, please follow our events, debates on our Twitter account also. Thank you so much. And uh, Olena, the floor is yours also. Thank you very much. I would like uh, to thank, to express uh, the gratitude uh, on behalf of, first of all, of, of, as a Ukrainian citizen, to the citizens of the free world, as I call, for being standing with us and to understanding uh, that we are in this together. And this is our common battle. And this we are fighting for our common future. And uh, this all what we have discussed uh, this support must uh, be increased and uh, the main logo i would say that help ukraine as if you would help your own country and it would be correct and actually and actually um uh, this is what we all need and thank you again for all the expert community here in Brussels, uh, in Poland, uh, in all countries of the European Union. We stand together. Yes, and my one of my main outcomes of today's event is that yes, we already today need to think about, uh, do need uh, to think about the future of Ukraine, not only to rebuild in a material sense of you, but also in the human and in all kind of you to rebuild our country and to make it uh, to make it strong, to make it resilient, and to make uh, to provide its European future. And I'm so grateful and I'm so happy that we have had a, a substantial time today allocated to discussion of this. And uh, on our, uh, I would like to thank uh, the Polish Institute of International Affairs colleagues and Lukas, especially you, to take in a, a huge burden in organizing the events, uh, given that I have a three months child. Thank you very very much and uh, um, I'm glad of this cooperation and I do know that this is not the last time until we win this war. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm closing. Thank you. I'm closing the, the event and thank you Press Club also for your technical and organization support. Bye-bye. Thank you. <laughs>